Well, I went to Yale when modernism was in vogue and everybody was teaching and practicing modernism. I worked for a number of modern architects, Ed Barnes, uh, Paul Rudolph being probably some of the most prominent of them. But I graduated from Yale having learned to be a modernist, went to New York, worked for a couple of modernists, and moved to Washington to uh, open my own practice. I moved to D.C. at the same moment the Historic Preservation Act was enacted. And the act really required that you be considerate of the context when you built in historic districts. Most of Washington at this point is a historic district. All of it wasn't then, but most of it is now. But a great many of the areas in which we worked were historic districts. And by working here, I got, and working in these historic districts, I got a very good lesson in contextualism and became convinced that the way we build should be highly dependent on the context in which we're building. When this Historical Preservation Act came out, then that forced you to look at those things, and then the, the close contact with that kind of thing led to the epiphany that this is... I don't think it forced me. It gave me the opportunity. Right. Um, and also there was a business imperative, too. Um, I <laughs> could have, like many of my cohort, said, I'm going to be a modernist. That's what I'm going to be, and just stuck with that and move forward. Right. Um, but that was not the choice I made. If you were going to distinguish the psychological view of buildings and people's relationship that modernism has versus the one that you then came to hold later, how would you contrast those? One of the distinctions between modern architecture and historically based architecture is that one's response to modern architecture is largely intellectual and the generation of modern architecture is largely intellectual. And one's people's response to histor historical-based architecture is more, much more emotional. And that how one feels about a building in traditional architecture is much more important than how one thinks about a building. Robert Stern had mentioned something about your uh, psychological insight into classicism, and you said, well, I don't know if I'm necessarily a, a classicist. So how would you self-describe now that you're not a modernist, but maybe not a classicist either? In my, what I just said to you, I was very careful to use the word traditional architecture rather right. than classical architecture. And if one looks at a, a dictionary definition of classicism, it's quite broader than most people' functional understanding of classicism. Right. But most <clears throat> people in, in current society view classicism as pediments and columns. Very narrow definition. Very, very narrow definition of classicism. Classical architecture is about portion and details, and there are all sorts of ways of, of making a classical expression that don't have columns and pediments. But right. I, don't, I don't think the world at large is so subtle as to understand that. <laughs> one of the things that you said in one of the monographs, I'll read it, you said, a person can choose whether or not to go into a museum, attend a concert, or read a book, but not which buildings make up the fabric of daily life. Understanding that, we believe that with the making of any building comes a very real responsibility to the public realm, which I think is absolutely true and praiseworthy. How have you been able to take that insight and bring it to bear on the reality of a client or developer who's hiring you, whose aspirations to do their civic duty may not extend to the fiscal, tangible realities that that view entails. Um, developers who don't embrace that um, vision generally don't tend to hire us. So it's a self-selecting thing. So Right. Could you maybe walk me through the process? I mean, one f incredible example is this maximum security jail that you designed for downtown. For so it's a jail that's unique. It's a city project. It's downtown. How did that work with the city and pricing and bids? Well, we were very much hired because of our, we've okay. built an awful lot in Fort Worth. That's right, and, yeah. And the city knew very well what they were getting when they chose us. Right. Um, they had built two hideously ugly jails. <laughs> um, in the two blocks next door. And no, it's, one was a courthouse, actually one was a jail. And I think there was a common feeling that if they were going to build a new jail, they wanted it to be more commodious in their city than their last attempt. Right. So I think that you know, hiring us came from a desire to have a very, very different kind of jail than the one they had sitting next door to it. <laughs> We were, everyone was amazed when we went after the jail as a, as a commission we very much wanted. We did. We, we worked very hard at getting selected. And that's why we wanted to do it. I mean, we've done a lot of one-off projects. We've won one, done one major league ballpark. Right. Uh, 
one major league arena. I mean, one arena for major league um, hockey and basketball. So we've done a lot of one-off pro- projects, and we we were interested in in the task of how do you design a jail and how do you design a jail that's urbanly responsible. A couple of other great architects have built great jails as well at the turn of the last century, and we wanted to count ourselves amongst their myths. How long was the process and the learning curve of just understanding? I mean, I don't imagine you know incarceration is a major topic in uh, it was in your curriculum. How long was the process of getting up to speed on that? Um, so much of our work we've only done one of that for us learning about the subject matter of a building is part of what makes doing that building type interesting. As I said, we've done one major league ballpark. We've done one arena. We've done one major library. We've done one herbarium. So for us, and, and, and I have a very short attention span, and one of the things I love about architecture is that I get paid and respected for being a dilettante. I get paid and respected for knowing a little bit about a lot of different things. So the notion of doing a whole bunch of one-off buildings from, from my particular personality type is perfect. They, they want me to learn about something for a little bit, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. As opposed to just being a well-renowned jail, jail architect your whole or life. Or hospital architect or business architect, uh, office building architect or retail architect or... That, to me, doing the same thing over and over and over again is really boring. And yet, both in development as in architecture, I mean, I'm sure that's kind of a path to some amount of business stability, right? So how were you able to avoid the trap of, you know, I've talked to developers who said, well, Walgreens approached this, and we're just going to develop every single Walgreens now, and that's all we do. We develop Walgreens one after the other, and they have a certain security in that. I, I noticed even in your monographs that there was a 25-year edition but then there's another five-year edition and five-year edition. So obviously you're getting more prolific. How, how did you how did you escape the? Yeah, you know those are harrowing years. You know when you're doing your first first. Um, I went to St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, you read a hundred books, they declare you educated. Mm-hmm. And part of the St. John's ethos is that they believe an educated man can teach anything. And on the Ethos of this office is a good designer can design anything. That was a really tough sell for years. And it prevented us from getting many commissions for a long time. When we did Children's Hospital, which is one of the most complex building types, and did a what has been a, 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 a very award-winning building and is a paradigm. Everybody who's building a new hospital goes to see children. It, it is one of the paradigmatic buildings of its type in the country. And after we designed that, people began to believe, well, maybe an edu- a good designer could design more than just all the same thing over and over again. Okay. Um, and after the ballpark in Arlington, it was an easy sell. Those two commissions paired, which have nothing to do with each other, right. and right. the incredible success of each project were very, very helpful in our... Um, they established the principle, the underlying principle. Right. One of the things that I like about the buildings uh, and structures that I encountered in Bill Addis's book was that they not only had that uh, rooted in history aesthetic, but they also had a, a building system that was rooted in history and also ready for history, so to speak. I mean, you know, a building with a six-foot brick wall, quadruple width or whatever, it's going to last forever. And that's why you have co- people constantly renovating 19th century factories. And I talked about this with Dr. Ribchinsky on an earlier episode I mean, it's, it's not really cost-effective to build that way, but do you kind of bemoan the end of that because it means shorter lifespans for buildings, or have you found a way around that? I, I think that's an erroneous argument. There are two things. One, one is the frequency with which a building has to be renovated. If you renovate a glass curtain wall building and you maintain it, it'll last forever. But what you have to do is replace the glass curtain wall every 20 years, long before it fails. So I don't think it's inherent in the fact, um, I, I think what you're saying, which is in fact true, is if you have a building with six foot brick walls, it suffers abuse much more gracefully than yeah, a building yeah. that doesn't. And if buildings don't suffer abuse gracefully, they don't last as long. If you look at some of the great concert halls in Europe, some of them are still entirely built out of wood. Um, they've right. been around three, 400 years. Some of them have been renovated, and a great deal of the wood has been replaced with steel. 
the lifespan of a building really is much more dependent on the building's maintenance than it is on how the building's built. Gotcha. And changing um, the oil, so to speak. Exactly. Exactly. We do ask our clients how long they want their buildings to last, and we do build them differently according to how long they want them to last. When we built Bass Hall, Ed Bass said he wanted it to last for 300 years. We made a whole bunch of adjustments to make that easy. Not that it wouldn't have lasted for 300 years without those adjustments. But, but for example, yeah, you... um, we made all of our sta- flashing out of stainless steel. Having made the flashing out of stainless steel meant that you didn't have to replace it ever. Had you gone in every 80, 100 years and replaced the flashing, the through wall flashing in the walls, the building would have still lasted, but it's a hell of a pain in the ass to go Yeah, that's that. a pretty involved process. <laughs> right. Okay. Much easier to do it with stainless steel up front. Interesting. So I don't think that how long buildings last you know, they have to be well built. That's certainly true. They can't leak. There's nothing like water to destroy a building quickly. Right. But if you keep the envelope of a building weathertight and you maintain the building on a, on a regular basis, it should last a long time. When I was much, much, much younger and early in our practice, I was in Beijing. And I learned while I was there that there is no word in Chinese for maintenance. And the notion was, you know, when it fell apart, you built a new one. And in a you know, land of earthquakes and, and, and grass huts. Right, yeah, what's the um, use? What's the use, right. So there is this, this street, I don't know if it's still happening or not, but when I was there it was, where the Chinese government built a pair of buildings on either side of a street, same plan, and every year they built another pair of buildings. And I was probably there in 1970, early 80s, and they started building these in 1951. And you could see the degeneration of a building. The ones at the end were covered with grass, the windows were out, grass was growing out over the walls, and the newest ones were new, um, perfectly um, oh, shiny, oh. And, and you could walk down the street and see the decay of a building that's not maintained. It was fascinating. But, you know, we, we can build buildings that are easier and harder to maintain. That's unquestionably true. Okay. And we can build buildings that are more and less subject to, to abuse. But inherently, the how long a building lasts isn't a question of, of how it's built. It's a question of how it's taken care of. Do you have any advice that you would convey to young developers as stuff that's Hard to see in their position, but important to see nonetheless. One of the things we've spent a career teaching people <clears throat> is that quality and architecture make a difference in rent. Mm-hmm. And that the, the, there is a, a direct monetary reward for building better buildings. It's really interesting. A number of years ago, we built a building for a developer right across the street from another building he was building. They were identical sites. Very similar right. footprints. Right. He had broken ground on the building across the street. I mean, this guy had known for a long time, and he had already fully designed the building he was building that we ended up designing. And I walked into his office one day, and the model had just been developed, and he said, David, I want to show you my model of my new building. I want you to tell me what you think. And I said to him, you don't want to hear what I think. Don't ask me this question. Let's stay friends. Um, and this went back and forth for 15 minutes. He finally said, no, I really... He'd already kicked me out of his office, literally, physically, once. And I wasn't (laughs) interested in going there again. And so I said to him, blank, you're too rich, too successful, and too far along in your career to keep building such ugly buildings. It's inexcusable. And he said, do you think you can do better? And I said, yeah, I think we can do better. And he said, okay, you've got two weeks to show me a better design. Came back two weeks later and showed him what we all agreed was a better design. And he said to me, okay, um, I have the working drawings for this building done, and I have contracts for construction. If you can make me a better building without moving any of the interior columns, you move all the exterior ones, can't move right. any of the interior right. ones, I'll build it. And this was at a point in my career where that was a huge deal. Yeah. So we did. And because he had bid the building, we knew exactly what it cost to build a bad building, and we knew what the cost premium was to build our building. The cost premium for our building was about $5 a square foot in construction. Because he was renting the building across the street at the same time he was renting our building, we knew exactly what the rent premium right, was. Right, right. He rented our building for about $5 a foot more. And it was perfectly clear that the only difference was the architecture. Yeah. And it made it perfectly clear to him that architecture sells. Right. Architecture right. makes a difference. Very hard to convince people of that fact. 